I'm so thankful that you are with us here on this Wednesday night, and uh, so thankful that we're able to come uh, to you live stream again, and looking and longing for the time when uh, we're going to be back together here, and uh, hopefully real, real soon. But uh, I hope to bring a, a challenging message to you tonight, and uh, just to hopefully be uplifting and encouraging to you. I do want to give you a couple of updates. Um, we uh, uh, are, have added a YouTube channel, so if you, uh, by chance, are not going to be able to uh, be with us for one of the live streams, uh, we're not live streaming on YouTube, but what we're doing is taking the Facebook Live video and we're posting it on a YouTube account now. Uh, it's, uh, if you just uh, go to North Coast Baptist, it's uh, N -O, capital N-O-R-T-H, lowercase c-o-a-s-t, Baptist, North Coast Baptist, and you'll be able to uh, find uh, all of the, uh, the videos thus far and uh, any future ones as well. And, uh, you know, we have had uh, some uh, questions of whether we're going to continue uh, doing this, and uh, certainly we're going to look at and pray about uh, even beyond the scope of this uh, trial right now, and maybe uh, continuing these things on and using them. Uh, since they're already set up and moving forward. So uh, I'd ask that you pray with me about that as we uh, continue to move uh, move forward with that. So again, you'll be able to go back to uh, the YouTube or of course follow us on uh, Facebook Live uh, for all of our services. Uh, we're hoping again to be back uh, real soon. Uh, we're just trying to, uh, to, to gauge uh, when that is. So we do cover your prayers as we move forward uh, with that. And hopefully the desire of your heart is to be here. I've had the privilege this week to talk to some of our people. Uh, and uh, I, let me church, let me tell you something. I'm so encouraged uh, by uh, uh, many of you. Uh, I've been trying to stay in touch with some of our older uh, members uh, here of late. And uh, I'm so encouraged because they say, hey, so-and-so has called us. So-and-so has come by. We heard from so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, that is great. That's what a church is supposed to do is watch out for one another, uh, take care of one another, uh, help provide for one another. And uh, that, is, that is just a great blessing uh, to do that. And certainly in the time that we uh, are at, we, we need to do that and be aware of that. And so I'm thankful for those who are able to do that. Uh, I know many of you are out there praying, maybe aren't able to get out yourself, but thank you to those who are. I know it's been a great blessing uh, as I've spoken to many of our older folk and uh, been so encouraged and they have been so encouraged by that, and, and uh, what a great blessing that is. I do want to mention one prayer request uh, specifically. I want to pray for Margaret. Uh, Margaret, uh, uh, let alone being a little older, she, she's had some foot problems, so she's not able to, to get around, and so we need to be praying for Margaret uh, with, her, uh, with her foot problem. It's uh, hard enough being cooped up inside the home, but not even to get out and be able to walk and those things. Uh, so uh, you pray for, pray for Margaret. Uh, we're praying for Mrs. Pager. Uh, Mrs. Pager actually went through kind of the gamut of uh, a lot of the symptoms uh, recently with the COVID-19. And uh, we praise the Lord. She got her test results back today and they were negative for her. So we praise the Lord for that and uh, thank the Lord. And even Chrissy, uh, she's uh, back at work. I guess she went back today, maybe yesterday or today. And so we were thankful that God has uh, raised, uh, raised them up uh, as well. And, uh, and so I know there's others out there that are still uh, struggling with some sicknesses, uh, illnesses, uh, probably not what the big disease uh, going around is now, but certainly we can pray for one another that, uh, and, and rejoice when God uh, gives us a, a good answer uh, in that way. So we, we praise the Lord for that. Certainly pray for our, our president, pray for our country, pray for our governor and local leaders as well as they have some very difficult decisions uh, and trying to navigate this as well. And so uh, we're, we're going to pray here in just a moment. Um, I do want to remind you that uh, on Wednesday nights, we typically go over our Bible verse for the, uh, for the month. And so I hope that you're working on um, uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. I'm going to give you a moment just to get your Bible out uh, if you don't have it out already or your bulletin from this last week. And uh, what we're going to do, uh, I'm going to say it out loud. I'm going to say the reference. I'm going to say the verse. And then I'm going to say the reference one more time, just like we always do in church. And I would encourage you, uh, right where you're at, to uh, uh, say it out loud as well as we'll say it together as we're continuing to uh, uh, memorize uh, this verse 
Uh, and I believe this is the last Wednesday of this month, so we'll be heading to a new verse for next month. But uh, certainly, uh, um, as soul winning is our emphasis this year, it'll be a good verse for you to memorize. So here we go. We're going to say it together. Ready? Acts 1, 8. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth, Acts 1.8. So continue to memorize that through the end of the month, and we'll have another one for you uh, starting uh, next week. And we'll get that to you so you can begin. And hopefully you have your bulletin, or not your bulletin, but uh, your bookmark that Brother Bustle made for us all to be studying our verses. And so we'll be working on that uh, again next week. Uh, there is no soul winning Saturday. This was our normal Saturday to be off. Uh, and actually we're slated the next two Saturdays off. Uh, with everything going on uh, and with that let me say this keep an eye on the, the website and keep an eye on Facebook I know some of you don't have Facebook uh, or you know people who don't have Facebook and you're kind of tuned in anyway um, you know we're going to update it through the website as well uh, any updates of uh, changes with schedules uh, depending on how things go um, you know if things really start accelerating well in, in a good direction uh, that we may make some adjustments to our, our schedule and those things. But uh, certainly that's kind of the time frame we're looking at right now. I would love, church, uh, for us to be able to get back here for uh, uh, no less than Easter, obviously. We're planning on having service then, but I'd love to be back for Palm Sunday as well. So uh, you pray with me about that. Let's see what God's planning on doing, because that's, I think that would be a great thing uh, for our church. And even before that would be even better, but we'll, we'll kind of shoot for that mark right now. So I just want you to be uh, aware of that. And by the way, if we do come back on Palm Sunday, if we're, we're uh, going to do that, we will not have our normal fellowship like we do uh, for that Sunday. So that will be canceled and we'll have a normal uh, morning and evening service. So we'll give you a little bit more update of that uh, coming up this, this coming Sunday. Uh, we're, we're, definitely, we're still not going to be uh, meeting uh, together. Uh, and uh, so be aware of that. We're going to come to you live stream and hopefully you're able to uh, catch it uh, and, and be with us for that, okay? Well, let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to go to Matthew chapter 5 tonight. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here to uh, do uh, come through live stream, Lord, with our church body. And Lord, we know that, uh, again, we're reminded that this is just so unusual, so different than we, we normally do it, Lord. Um, and we trust that you have a purpose, you have a plan that's greater uh, Lord, I heard today, I heard from a preacher in, in Michigan, Lord, that they're live streaming for the very first time, and uh, somebody who had been away from the church for over three years, uh, tuned in and watched, uh, didn't want to come back to church at the time, but was able to watch, and begins the, the work of uh, restoration and repentance, Lord, and we just praise you and thank you for doing that, uh, and, and again, our desire would be that we'd be all be able to be here together. Uh, but Lord, uh, we're just trusting that this is your will as we move forward. And so we're, we're excited to see what you're going to accomplish. Uh, Lord, there may be somebody listening, uh, watching tonight that uh, is not even saved. I uh, certainly pray that they would search uh, for you with all of their heart. They will find you. You will reveal the, that you are the truth, the way, the life, and the truth. And uh, Lord, we just ask that you'll you'll do that work, but encourage our people. We thank you for uh, the good report from Mrs. Pager. We know it's been a difficult couple of days, especially when they're not feeling well and her treatment's up in the air and those type of things, Lord. So we pray that uh, you'll continue to work those uh, details out. And we're thankful, Lord, that her temperature came down and, uh, and that her report came back negative. We're thankful Chrissy's back at work and we're thankful, Lord, for your work there. We thank you, Lord, for uh, Margaret, uh, staying at Margaret, and for watching out for some of our older folk. But we pray for Margaret that you will uh, help her with her uh, foot problem, Lord, um, and also being isolated there. And to help us, Lord, and thank you, Lord, for all of our uh, people that are reaching out to those who are confined uh, and uh, of our older folk who are really, this disease is hitting a little harder. Thank you for them, Lord. Bless them and, and continue to use them. And uh, Lord, we uh, just pray that you'll be glorified tonight. Help me as I teach uh, from your word. Encourage our hearts, strengthen us, uplift us, and encourage us. Lord, if there's one listening that needs to be chastened and corrected and convicted tonight, we ask that you'd accomplish that as well. 
And we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do now. We love you. Thank you for loving us. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Matthew chapter 5. Um, I want to go through um, this passage of Scripture that begins the Sermon on the Mount, which most of you are familiar with. Um, we've done a lot of teaching over the years on the Sermon on the Mount uh, with the book of Matthew, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But I wanted to go through tonight. Um, we, we mention it often. Uh, we talk about it often because it, it makes for good preaching. But uh, in chapter 5, verse 13, the Bible says, You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt has have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle, but put it under a bushel, uh, and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We're going to look at the what's historically known as the Beatitudes. Um, the, I think there's ten of them there we're going to look at um, today. Um, and try to make some understanding or find some understanding of how they apply to us so that we will not lose our savor and become good for nothing. And the Bible's clear that once the light of Christ is in us, it's not something that can be hidden. There are no closet Christians. Uh, there are people who believe and don't live as Christ, but uh, those who are saved and those who are living right, they are a city set on a hill. They are the, the uh, picture of righteousness because they are living the life of Christ. And so uh, the two attributes that God has said we are, we are the salt of the earth and we are the light of the world. And so we want to be the brightest light. We want to be uh, a light that people look at and see the light of Christ. But we also don't want to become good for nothing. I think that's a derogatory term when you think about it. Who wants to be known as a good for nothing? The reality is, most of us probably know somebody in our life, whether it be a family or friend or neighbor or what, that we would look at, and at some point in our life, we have said, man, they are good for nothing. And uh, certainly that's not something we want to be identified as, as somebody who's good for nothing. And so when we look at the Beatitudes, uh, there's some great, uh, wonderful things that the Lord teaches to us, and we'll start in verse number three. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be glad, exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So when you look at this list and, and, and admonitions for us to have as a part of our life, to be poor in spirit, uh, to, to mourn, to, to uh, be meek, to hunger and thirst after righteousness, to be merciful, to be pure in heart, to be a peacemaker, to, uh, to uh, bless, be blessed when we're persecuted, and to rejoice and be exceeding glad. We, we, we strive to do those things, but sometimes... Uh, we fall short, and we understand we all fall short uh, many times in that. Sometimes when I study the Bible, I've mentioned this before, I like to study the opposite. Okay, well, if, if the Bible says, blessed are the poor in spirit, well, what is the opposite of poor in spirit? And so what I have found through this study that I've done, when you look at the opposite, it points out exactly how you can become good for nothing. And so what I want to do tonight is look at the opposite of what is being described to us here and look at the, uh, what, what through that declaration of truth, what the, the other truth really is about it and show us how we can prevent ourselves from becoming good for nothing as Christians. Uh, 
there's ever a time in the world that we need to live as Christians at our workplaces or at our homes or our society, it is now. And, uh, and, and we know, we believe we're in the generation that's going to see the return of the Lord. Many of us believe that the Lord is coming. And we just need to be as faithful to the Lord as possible in, in exhibiting these qualities in our life um, and, and doing these things and staying away from the things that are going to make us good for nothing. Uh, sadly, we've all heard of churches that have become good for nothing. We've all heard of pastors who have become good for nothing. We've all heard of church members who have become good for nothing. And we want to prevent that. We want to stop that from becoming good for, good for nothing. So we want to be good for something. But uh, how do we prevent ourselves from, from becoming good for nothing and to be thrown out and shrouded under the foot of men? So let me give these to you quickly and uh, talk about them a little bit, and then we'll, we'll wrap things up tonight. Number one, let me tell you this. And when you see blessed are the poor in spirit, um, obviously talking about a spiritual bankruptcy, a spiritual um, uh, understanding of no value whatsoever. Uh, so many today are, are, are elevated and puffed up in their thinking. Even in the church house, uh, there's this idea that we have to build up everybody's self-esteem. Um, we have to tell them how valuable they are because um, uh, maybe somebody didn't tell us how valuable we were to them. And so we, we feel like we got to tell everybody how valuable. You know, when you get saved, you know exactly how valuable you are because you know Christ did everything for you. And uh, you understand that you have no worth. You have no value without the Lord Jesus Christ. But with him, he knows and he lets you know that you have value now to the Lord. And nobody has to tell you that. Nobody has to puff you up for that. So the poor in spirit is somebody who knows they are spiritually bankrupt. That they are broken and poor. So let me say it this way. If you esteem yourself or you count yourself of more value than others, you risk losing your savor and becoming good for nothing. You know, one of the things, uh, and we're going to use our Bibles today. Hopefully you've got your Bible uh, there. But if you go to Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, which is very familiar verses. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that which is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We know those verses. We understand those verses. We try to live those verses. And we're, now that we're saved, we, we present our bodies a living sacrifice. But the very first thing that we find, uh, verse number three in that same passage says this, for I say, through the grace given unto me. By the way, that's the only way we can do it. That's the only way that, uh, that you and I can present our bodies a living sacrifice is through the grace of God. Now, we talked about value just a moment ago when the Bible says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he were rich, he became poor, that through his poverty, uh, for your sakes, he might be rich. And so he adds the value. And he poured his value into you. And now uh, through that same grace, it says to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Man, sometimes uh, I, I wrote down three areas here that I think people sometimes esteem themselves better than other people. And Philippians 2 tells us, to esteem others better than ourselves. That means to count other people more worthy than ourselves. If you count people more worthy, you'll be willing to sacrifice to the Lord for them and for, for the Lord. Because you count them more than you count their life more valuable than your own. You're willing to die for them. That's the greater love. But I think there's three areas that sometimes people get a little puffed up. They get a little arrogant. They, they get a little uh, counting themselves a little bit more valuable. Well, certainly intellectually. Sometimes people think they're so much smarter than other people. Well, they got it all figured out. And the Bible says you better be careful professing yourself to be wise because those that profess themselves to be wise when they forgot God, they became fools. And I'll tell you, there's, uh, it's hard to talk to somebody who thinks they're intellectually, intellectually superior to somebody else. Now, we know people sometimes are intellectually superior, but those who go around telling people or acting that way 
uh, certainly run the risk of becoming good for nothing because nobody likes a braggart. So intellectually, I think people uh, can esteem themselves more valuable intellectually. Uh, by the way, the only wisdom you have and I have is Jesus became our wisdom. He became wisdom to us. And the only wisdom we have is through the Lord Jesus Christ. I think inspirationally people esteem themselves. Like, like they, they, they strive. I hear this a lot. We, we're, we're striving to make a difference in people's life. We're striving uh, to impact people's life. And, and we're striving to change the world. And we're striving. God's not called us to change the world. God's not called us to strive to do that. What he's called us to do is to, to, to uh, make ourselves, uh, through the love of God, keep ourselves in the love of God and do live the godly life and live the Christian life. And that will make the difference in people's life. That's how change takes place. Sometimes we think we're, we're more inspirational uh, through the way we live uh, than, than what we really are. And I think indispensably, I think some people get to the point thinking the world's going to stop the moment you draw your last breath. Certainly as a teenager growing up, you, you kind of have that mindset like, man, the world revolves around me. I mean, everything depends upon me. And sometimes we esteem ourselves indispensable. Man, when, sometimes we go to work. I, you know, when I worked out in, the, in uh, secular work, uh, when I worked at the car dealership, man, guess what? Every one of those car dealerships was there before I got there. Every job I ever held was there before I got there. And it's still there. And, uh, and, and listen, we're not indispensable. Sometimes we get that idea like we are indispensable, but we're not. So be careful that you don't allow yourself to esteem yourself more valuable than other people because you'll risk losing your savor and becoming good for nothing. And let me show you the second one. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Uh, I believe, by the way, let me back up for a moment, let me say this. I believe that these Beatitudes, as we know them as, are actually a progression of what happens when somebody gets saved. First of all, they realize they're spiritually bankrupt and broken, and then what happens, they, it breaks their heart. Godly sorrow worketh repentance, not to be repented of. So it, it, there's a progression here, and then that humbles you, and, and, uh, and that causes, gives you a desire to hunger and thirst after righteousness, and, 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 and makes you more merciful, and, 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 and purifies your heart. And, uh, and you seek now for peace and, and you'll be persecuted. So there's an absolute progression there with that. So they kind of go hand in hand. But I want to point this out. Blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. If you are callous or hard, unfeeling or hardened to sin and its effect on you and others, you risk losing your savor and becoming good for nothing. Be careful becoming content in your sin. Be careful becoming complacent, not allowing sin to affect you. You know, lying is still lying, and it should, it should break your heart when you tell a lie. It should break your heart when you, when you go off and commit willful sin. It ought to break your heart when you commit sin that you're not even aware of, and God reveals it to you, it ought to break your heart. If you become callous to sin, I say this often to uh, many people who, I, I know we have many people in our church that uh, should be, struggling, should be struggling with cigarette smoking. Uh, it's filthy. It's a, it's, a, it's a horrible sin that you ought not to be involved in. And, you know, people sometimes can travel. It ain't as bad as this. It doesn't matter if it's as bad as this, but you should be struggling. If you're not struggling with that anymore, you've become callous to God purifying your life. And so you're not broken about it anymore. Sin's effect on you you become callous or hardened or unfeeling on the effect of it, listen, you're going to become good for nothing. You're going to become, uh, you're going to lose your savor, your, what you add, the flavor that you bring. Um, the, that whets the appetite of somebody for, for Christ. It's, it's going to be hard to, 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 for somebody to long after Christ with a big old cigarette or cigar or, or vaping thing out of your mouth. Be hard if you got a bottle in your hand of alcohol. It's gonna be real hard to. Uh, you become callous and you become uh, 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 to sin and, to, and its effect on you. Be careful because it's gonna lead to a place where you'll be good for nothing. So if you're callous to sin and, and its effect on you and others, uh, be careful because you risk losing your savor 
and become a good for nothing. Let me show you the third one. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Meekness is often referred, uh, relates to humility. So what would be the opposite of humility would be? would be pride. If you are proud and stout-hearted, you risk losing your savor and becoming good for nothing. If you are proud and stout, you, you know the problem with pride is we never know, we're never willing to admit that we're proud because we're too proud to admit it. Everybody else knows we're dealing with pride. But we don't realize we're dealing with pride. That's the deceitfulness of sin. That's, by the way, that's the spirit of the devil is pride. He's the child, the king of the children of all pride. And so if you're proud and stout-hearted, blessed are the meek. If you are proud and stout-hearted, uh, you know, uh, obstinate, uh, arrogant, or defiant. Uh, if that's your spirit, if that's your attitude, uh, my friend, be careful because you risk losing your savor and becoming good for nothing. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16, 18. Uh, when a man is lifted up in pride, there's no telling what he will do. And, uh, and, and, and as I already mentioned, the problem with pride is we don't often realize we're living in pride. Um, and certainly if we do, then we're in graver danger of the chastening of the Lord. But if you're proud, and you're stout-hearted. You say, well, give me an example. Well, let me say it this way. If you can never be corrected, you're a proud individual. There isn't a single person on this earth that at some point doesn't need to be corrected. And if you feel that swelling up of resentment or angst or uh, superiority, uh, when somebody tries to correct you or somebody points out or when a preacher preaches something that kind of uh, gets at you and needles you, you're proud. And it always, God's word is always true. It always has a distraction. Uh, God's not called us to be arrogant or obstinate or defiant. Um, submit yourself under every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Uh, certainly we've dealt with that in, in, in recent uh, weeks. We believe in civil obedience. We believe in uh, that. Uh, thankfully, churches themselves have uh, not been put under the order uh, as far as the governor's order. And it's left to every church uh, to decide to do that. I think the governor has gone out of his way to uh, make sure that the First Amendment rights of people are, are uh, adhered to and preserved. And so I think it's uh, incumbent uh, upon our church to help. Uh, with the, uh, the the health issue that's going on. And so, um, you know, we could be defiant towards that. We could be obstinate towards that. And we say, well, bless God, we're going to do this. And, you know, uh, I don't think that's productive to have that attitude. I know churches, great friends of mine, preachers that are having church services, but their, their attitude is not, hey, we're going to do this because we're going to shove it in somebody's face. We can't do that. That's pride and that's stout-heartedness. And that's defiance. And, and uh, if you, you do that, you're going to risk losing your savor and becoming good for nothing. Let me show you the next one here. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. If you find satisfaction and contentment through unrighteousness, you risk losing your savor and becoming good for nothing. Do you realize that if you're to the point where sin doesn't bother you anymore, you're content with sin, uh, you have quenched the Holy Spirit of God. You are in a vulnerable uh, place where God can deal with you in a very difficult and, and uh, harsh way because you have so quenched the spirit that you, are, you have no discernment, you have no judgment, and you are actually become just like a reprobate of Romans chapter 1. You have no discernment. And if you are satisfied and content with unrighteousness, uh, my friend, listen, if you're not hungering and thirsting after what God wants, you will hunger and thirst after something else. And that's going to lead to losing your savor and becoming good for nothing. Let me give you another one here. Verse 5 says, um, I'm sorry, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And so uh, if you are unwilling to love and forgive others through their faults and failures, you risk losing your savor and becoming good for nothing. Let me repeat that. If you are unwilling, you say, why would you say unwilling, preacher? Because unforgiveness, not willing to forgive, is a choice. 
There isn't a single thing that somebody has done to you uh, or towards you uh, or around you or to your family or to your church that cannot be forgiven. There isn't a single thing in marriage that can't be forgiven. I, I've heard preachers over the years, and I know many people say, well, the only thing in the Bible that God says we can get divorced for is because of adultery. It's not in the Scriptures. The Bible just says that divorce ends in adultery eventually is what happens. But you tell me you can't forgive somebody that, that wrong? You can't choose to forgive them? Uh, and, 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 and so, again, we have to be careful that we don't uh, allow things that go beyond the Scriptures. You can forgive. And, and Jesus said, for the hardness of a man's heart, um, Moses wrote in the writing bill of divorcement. So what would the hardness of heart be? Not willing to forgive. Not willing to forgive. Or I can flip it around and say somebody's not willing to, to live a righteous life and do it the right way. But, but certainly, uh, forgiveness is essential. Uh, in Matthew chapter 6, just a, a chapter over, uh, we see that, uh, that uh, what many people call the Lord's Prayer. Again, we would take issue with that. But we understand what's being said here. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Um, you know, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And it, but it comes to a point where it says this. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. Uh, that's why the Lord ends the... Uh, after he ends the prayer or the pattern of prayer, he says, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And that's certainly not talking about salvation there. That's talking about practical righteousness, practically forgiving somebody and doing it right. And so if you're unwilling to do that, listen, listen, you're going to become, uh, you're going to lose your savor and you're going to become Good for nothing. Uh, let me give you another one here. We'll go back to chapter 5. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Uh, if you lack sincerity, integrity, and purity in what and how you do something, you risk losing your savor and becoming good for nothing. If you lack sincerity, integrity, and purity in what and how you do something, you risk losing your savor and becoming good for nothing. Uh, obviously, the pure in heart is dealing with intentions or motivations. Um, we know that God told uh, Samuel in the Old Testament when he was looking for the next king after Saul had failed uh, God miserably in that role. Um, he says, uh, I want you to, to go give me another king and I'm going to give you the one that I want. And, uh, and, and he says something to the point of, you know, uh, man looketh at the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. So we're reminded that God has uh, made it able for us to be pure in heart, pure in our intentions. By the way, I believe it was D.L. Moody, uh, and I may be wrong on that, but, but uh, one of the old-time preachers used to say all the time, you know, this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. And, and that goes along with it, because uh, the Bible says the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and is uh, 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 the joints of the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And so many people will stop uh, reading the word of God because they're impure in their intentions because you've got to uh, look at this Bible as a mirror and, and you look at it and, and it convicts you and, and people will either turn away from it or hopefully they'll get right with God. But uh, be careful if you lack sincerity, integrity, and purity in what and how you do something, uh, listen, you, you run the risk of losing your savor and becoming good for nothing. Let me give you another one here. It says, blessed are the peacemakers. If you choose contention and strife over striving for peace, you risk losing your savor and becoming good for nothing. If you choose contention and strife over striving for peace, you risk losing your savor now, if you go with me over to Proverbs chapter 17, in Proverbs 17, there's a couple of verses I want you to see in Proverbs 17. Uh, the first one I want you to see is verse 19. It says, He loveth transgression that loveth strife. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, transgression, the Bible tells us, is 
sinning against God's word. So uh, sin is the transgression of God's law, transgressing of God's law. So we know that when it says he loveth transgression, that means he loves sin. Uh, he loves sin that, or transgression that loveth strife. So basically, if you love the fight, if you love the friction, if you love the antagonist, uh, being the antagonist, the Bible says that's a that's a sinful uh, issue that 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 you have uh, in your life, and you actually love transgression. So I don't love transgression. Well, that's what the Bible says, and the Bible's right. So he that loved or he loved transgression and loveth strife. So what you do is look at verse fourteen. This is how you handle strife. The beginning of strife is as when one letteth out water. Therefore, leave off contention before it be meddled with. So if you think about, you know, a, a faucet at home, and, and that faucet is running, uh, and you come in the room and you see the faucet running, it would be foolish for you not to go over there and shut the faucet off. If you let that thing run, it's going to cost you more money because you're going to waste water, uh, possibly overflow and flood something. If, if something gets jammed in there and stuck in there, create more damage. So the best thing to do is when you see it happening, just turn it off. Now, most of us, we turn it on. We turn on full board. We just turn on both of them, and we go at it. And many marriages are that way. Many marriages, boy, they look, they know what buttons to push, and they are looking for that button. They're looking for that power to come. They're looking for that, man, they go after it. Boy, your marriage, your home, your life would be so much better if you saw somebody who was, who was looking for a fight, somebody who was looking for an argument. Just go turn that faucet off and don't give them the, 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 the pleasure uh, of, uh, of, of a good argument. If you choose contention and strife over striving for peace, you risk losing your savor and, uh, and becoming good for nothing. Now let me give you two more here quickly and then we'll be wrapped up. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If your suffering is from sinful choices not for religious persecution you risk losing your savor and becoming good for nothing. Again, if you are suffering, if your suffering is from sinful choices, not from religious persecution, you risk losing your savor and becoming good for nothing. And Peter talks about this in 1 Peter chapter 4, where he says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And he says, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Listen, suffering is a part of the human existence, but hopefully it's because we're, we're living right. And that's why the, the suffering comes, the persecution comes. But if, if we're suffering because of our sinful choices, uh, you risk losing your savor and becoming good for nothing. And then lastly... We see rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. If you lack joy and gladness in the midst of difficult and trying times, you risk losing your savor and becoming good for nothing. If you lack joy and gladness, we looked at Sunday night, how God uses trials in the life of a Christian. And the first one was to examine our joy, to see what's the source of our joy, the sincerity of our joy. Why are we uh, lacking joy? You know, many of us lack joy because we're just not thankful people. We're more complainers and murmurers than we are thankful. Because the Bible says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known before all men, for the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Many people can't rejoice in the Lord. They can't have joy and be, be glad because they're too focused on what they're going through. You know, hope is, you know, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of men most miserable. Hope was given us to us by the Lord, who is the Lord, to be inspirational, to keep our eyes heavenward, that in the midst of difficult and trying times, we wouldn't lose sight of the fact uh, of God's promises for our life. I don't know about you, but I don't want to become good for nothing. I want to be good for something. I want God to be able to use me for something. 
But, but I've got to make sure that these attributes are in my life, that I'm poor in spirit. You know, we've talked about before Paul, the more he grew in the Lord, the more he saw himself as more unworthy than the day before. You know, your spiritual maturity does not lead to a belief that we are more uh, superior or more valuable than anybody else. It leads to a depreciating value of oneself and appreciating value of the Lord Jesus Christ and how much we need him and, and, and rely upon him. So the question is, are you on the path to become a good for nothing or a good for something? Are you poor in spirit? Are you, uh, are you mourning about and broken about uh, sin? Uh, have, you, have you lost sight of uh, the effects of sin and that uh, every time you sin, it's like pre re-crucifying Jesus? Are you meek? Are you hungering and thirsting after righteousness? Are you merciful? Are you pure in your intentions and your sincerity, your integrity and your purity? Are you seeking after peace with those that you have conflict with? Are you living right and persecution is coming because you're living right? Are you rejoicing and exceedingly glad for what God has done in your life? I don't want to become a good for nothing. I know you don't want to become a good for nothing. And so we've got, to, we've got to live what this Bible says. And thankfully, as we saw in Romans 12, verse 3, by the grace of God, we can do it. And God can, can keep this church as the salt of the earth and the salt of this community and the salt and the light of this world and light of this community. But our job is to, to kind of fit in the uh, pieces of the puzzle so that God gets all the glory. And if we get to the point where uh, things just don't matter the way they used to, well, what do you do with something that's good for nothing? You either put it away somewhere and say, ah, I'll just put it on a shelf somewhere, and it can sit there and collect dust and do nothing. Or it can be thrown in the, uh, in the trash, ah, just get rid of the sink. Uh, it's of no use to me anymore. And certainly none of us want to get to that place in our life. And God, if we live for the Lord, we're never going to get to that place in our life. And God will get the glory out of our lives. Listen, if you're, if you're listening tonight and you're not even saved, uh, listen, you need to be saved. The Bible says four things. One, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Two, we, uh, we, the wages of sin is death. And because we're sinners, the Bible says Christ died for us. And, and if we would acknowledge that, if we would accept that truth and, uh, and acknowledge that truth, the Bible says that we call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. You can be saved tonight. But I know I'm probably talking to most Christians, probably most members of our church. What are you doing to prevent becoming a good for nothing? Hopefully, you're staying in your word. Hopefully, you're staying close to the Lord. And if you do that, you'll never become a good for nothing. And you'll always be a good for something. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this time to be here tonight. Thank you for our church family. Uh, Lord, we again uh, yearn and long to be together once again here real soon. In the meantime, Lord, help us to be that light of the world and the salt of the earth where we're, where we're at. Lord, help our people. Some are struggling with illness. Some are struggling with job loss. Uh, Lord, certainly we pray tonight uh, that our nation, uh, who has abandoned you many, many years ago, uh, collectively, uh, Lord, is not in a place where we're good for nothing and being thrown away. But Lord, may revival take place out of this dark time of our, of, of our country. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us all to do our part, uh, to draw close to you. The Bible says if we do that, you'll draw nigh unto us. So thank you, Lord. We ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to post this video here in just a little bit up to uh, YouTube, so it'll be available there. Um, thank you for tuning in. Um, if you have any prayer requests, you can always reach us by Facebook. You can call the office, 216-521-3800. Free free to do that. Um, and I'd uh, love to get those prayer requests out. Work on your Bible verse for the month. Uh, we'll, uh, maybe Sunday we'll have that next one for you so you can begin working on that uh, for next month. And we'll just keep praying and hoping that we'll be back together here real soon. So we love you all. Keep praying for one another. Reach out to one another. Care for one another. And God bless you. You have a good evening. Thanks for tuning in.